Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, as uh, Alyssa said, my name is uh, Zaina Bizri. Uh, I have a PhD in uh, history with a focus on gender and women's studies. And that's where I started with uh, my uh, deep dive into women in World War II. And I'm going to share my screen so you can see my presentation and hopefully y'all can see it. So uh, I actually came to this question uh, because my grandmother was a nurse's aide uh, during World War II um, or after World War II and she had gotten training during World War II, but she had worked in a factory, the Frigidaire factory, one of the Frigidaire girls making mess kits. And she would tell us stories about uh, going to work while her husband was in the military or her work after the war using the training she had gotten. So I wondered, uh, how that happened. And knowing people in the military, women in the military, I said, well, how, how do we go from war is a man's job um, up until I thought at the time, World War II, and then how does it become a woman's job? Well, first things first, war has never been only a man's job. Women have been in every war in some capacity um, for as long as we have records. Um, they've been part of the U.S. military officially since World War I and auxiliaries to the U.S. military since the revolution. So women have always been there. But my question was turned into how do we tell women who have believed that women don't belong in the military, that there is no space for women in the military? How do we convince them very, very quickly <laughs> that they need to be in the military and that their work is vital? The answer partly was advertisements. Um, I, I, as a feminist scholar, uh, I have been looking at kind of the stories that we tell through media. And so I got to this point and I was like, you know, let me take a look at the advertisements and see how they're selling this. So there we go. This is how we begin. Uh, so this poster here is from 1942 and it's specifically for the submarine service. Uh, in 1942, uh, submarining was entirely voluntary, and it is, it is in fact still entirely voluntary. So it's, um, they had to find a way basically to convince men to do it. And yes, they are increasing pay. And yes, they are giving extra training, extra education. There is an extra kind of social boost, like dudes who go into the submarine service are badasses is really kind of what they're saying in the 40s. But they also pull out this beautiful woman who is with this sailor because he's a submariner. And there are a lot of posters like this. There's a lot of uh, advertisements. There are a lot of things of men doing something special, becoming a paratrooper, again, submarine service, um, any kind of just signing up uh, when it doesn't seem like it's something that you would do will get you the pretty girl to be your girlfriend. Um, women aren't individuals at this point. They are at best accessories. Um, at worst, they're prizes. So how do we take this idea that, that women are not involved at all except as a prize for men to earn when they join up and turn them into vital parts of the system? Well, when we start building, excuse me, when we start building these uh, auxiliaries, these women's services out, there's a lot of confusion as to how they work. Uh, so the Women's Army Service or the Women's Army Corps or Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, uh, it starts out as an auxiliary, becomes the Army Corps. It's the whack either way. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they are created in early 1940 or mid-1942. And uh, that leg legislation passes in June. And then legislation to create the waves, women's women accepted for voluntary emergency service. Uh, for the Navy, they are created in, later in the summer of 1943. The WAVES recruiting kind of follows the WAC recruiting because in both cases, they don't really know why women should join. Here's the thing about World War II. It is a total war. It is Everybody is involved. Uh, the scale of this war is like nothing anyone has seen before. 
I mean, we have to go back to the ancient period with Alexander of Macedon and the Persian Wars to find this level of manpower commitment percentage wise, not hard numbers, but percentage wise uh, that is that's comparable to what we see in World War Two. And this is following World War One, which absolutely destroyed the armies of Europe. So the number of people that are being thrown into the military globally is astronomical. Uh, they don't have the numbers. They don't actually have the men available in the U.S. population in 1942 to fill the amount of men that they need. Okay, so we have uh, a population of 136 million, roughly, in uh, 19, that's 1940. And in order to get men into the army, they have to go through a series of recruiting steps. Uh, they have to be, number one, be of the right age range, which is in 1942 is 18 to 35. They have to be healthy enough to hold up to it. So they have to have a certain height. They have to uh, be a certain weight. They have to not have their vision be within certain parameters. They can't be deaf. They can't have uh, damage to their skeletal system. They can't have a history of chronic illness or anything like that. So out of every person that they look at, every man that they look at, 75% are deemed not fit for combat. Uh, fit for combat 1A. Uh, and uh, the 1As, uh, again, 25%. So you need four men to get that one guy. Now we also have to deal with the fact that the army and the military in general is becoming a much more bureaucratic entity. Um, we are actually getting a bureaucracy that can do things like get people to the right training departments and get bullets and guns to people who are going to the front line, both of which were issues <laughs> in prior centuries. So we do have to have this fairly large bureaucracy. And by the time we start World War One, uh, World War One, it's uh, it's about one to one, one combat soldier for every one bureaucratic soldier. By World War II, it is one combat soldier is supported by four uh, bureaucratic soldiers. Today, it's one to eight. So just to give you an idea of kind of the structure that we're talking about. So we have our one combat soldier, okay? Our one guy who is, they can take in. So they've looked at four guys and they've gotten one. Now they need to get four other men to fill those support roles, okay? So now we need to look at 20 men because we need five men so out of four times that is 20, okay? Now we're looking for uh, 90 divisions are authorized. That is a, something like an army, ooh, that's an army of about 3 million, okay? Um, that's not including building in people for casualties, okay? Uh, an army expects uh, that a, an acceptable casualty rate is, again, one out of every four. They'd like it to be one out of every five as acceptable. Like, they need to be big enough to absorb that and still have a functional military. And when we start calculating out the numbers as we go through this, we get somewhere between 90 million to 115 million, uh, depending on which figures you're using. And the population of the U.S. as a whole, as I said, is 136 million. And they do the math and they say, oh, we're out of bodies. We're just out of bodies. Uh, and so they say, well, what jobs need done that women can do? And they say, well, women can fill these support roles. And how do we do that? And there, is, there are weeks of debate in Congress after the bill is written. And there are months of debate prior to that of figuring out how to structure this bill specifically for the WAC. Uh, to bring women into the military. What jobs are they going to do? What structure are they going to be in? Are they going to be uniformed? Are they going to be part of the medical system? Are they going to get pensions? And they come up with women as auxiliaries with the army, but not in it. Okay, so they don't have access to the same structures that a lot of the men do. This is a problem. This is why the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps in 1942 becomes the Women's Army Corps in 1943. They've just put the women in the army. The waves just put the women in the Navy. Just you are part of the Navy, welcome aboard. <laughs> just not even dealing with it. Um, once they do that, they start assigning women to different jobs. Um, the big number for the army is 236 jobs 
that they came up with during the congressional hearings before they had any women in. They had 236 jobs that they said that women could do. And it's things that a lot of people just don't think of. It is things like working in the quartermaster, working as clerks, working filing, typists, working as interpreters, telephone operators, uh, mail clerks, uh, delivery, uh, like couriers. Women start becoming drivers. They work in mechanic pools. They learn all different kinds of jobs. Of course, they are also given jobs like cook and baker and dietitian, and they are also assistants to things like um, chemists and uh, working in ordinance and a lot of logistical stuff. Something like 40 to 60 percent of women who enlist, depending on the branch, are working in administrative tasks, but they are vital to the success of the military. And that's the thing that they finally latch onto. We have this big military. But we have this big administration that's even bigger that needs to make this combat arm actually function. And that is where we can use women. They put into the legislation, women aren't going into combat. No, 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 not a thing that's going to happen because how would men react? That is actually uh, the thing. Whoop. That is actually the question. How do men react to women being in the military, will they suddenly stop fighting and go take care of a wounded woman? How will they deal with women uh, appearing in male-only spaces? And there's a lot of, of distress in Congress over this. Um, at one particular point when they are uh, doing the con congressional hearing for the WAVES bill, um, the admiral is speaking and a senator says to him, um, are you sure that you need these women for actual things? And it's and he's the, the quote is it is not a matter of, of uh, looking for pulchritude. You're not just looking for cute girls to put in your office is what he's saying. And the admiral replies with no, sir. We need the women to fill jobs that men would do, but we need the men to fight, so the jobs need doing. And that's always the logic is we need the men to fight. The jobs still need doing, so let's just get women in those jobs that they can do. So that's really kind of where we're at in 1942 into 1943. But because of those posters where the woman is just the accessory, where women are uh, kind of extraneous to the whole system, uh, that is a problem because these do not appeal to women and they have to really ramp up their recruiting effort. Uh, we make a big deal about how World War II is a, a great example of American volunteerism. We were conscripting men into the military in early, uh, in early 1942. Um, the initial attack on Pearl Harbor is December 7th, 1941. And we have to turn to conscription. I think it's uh, March or April of 1942. It's just dropped off too much. And there's not enough uh, uh, new men coming in that they can put into the army, uh, that they can cover their manpower needs. So yeah, with the selective service and uh, the draft really kicks in quite, quite early. There is a question of, do we draft women? If we put women in the military, will they be subjected to the draft? And because women are not allowed in combat arms, they are kept in limited roles, especially in the 40s when we're just creating these women's groups. Uh, no, women are not uh, subjected to the draft. Ergo, we must recruit them. So the, the crux of the question then is what do women do and why are they doing it in the military? And then how do we teach that? How do we convince them that doing it in the military is the best way for them to use their skills? Because alongside this, we have a massive push in industry to supply not just the U.S., but the rest of the allies. We have a massive push to get people working on farms because all of Europe's uh, food growing regions are getting blown up regularly. Uh, so we have a lot of production work happening in the U.S. that also needs people. And we have limits on able-bodied young men who could go into the military, except they're working in heavy industry in a war-related industry, something like in a shipyard or an airplane factory. And they are considered vital to that job. They need a man to fill that job. And that man is not able to give up his job and go enlist. Um, so what do we do with that? And so we have a real push to get women into the factories. As I said at the top, that's how my grandma ended up working at the Frigidaire factory making mess kits. Uh, the men who worked there 
shipped out. And so the women stepped in and took those jobs. A lot of women were really thrilled. Uh, there are women who are already working in the early 1940s, working as shop girls, working uh, as telephone operators or typists, or they're working as domestic laborers. And they have a real chance to jump into something that's going to get them a better income. And so they, they make the leap into industry. So why would they go into the military if they can make a lot of money in the, in the industry? So that's the mess that the OWI, Office of War Information, walks into in early 1943. So these two posters here, uh, the two waves recruiting posters that, that feature, that men are the, actually the focal point, even though they're for women. These are uh, from early spring. These are, uh, the, uh, the telegram one is from, I think that went out in February, and then the train one went out in March. I might have them backwards, but they're both in early, early 1943. But uh, both of them, they have, the woman has a man, and her man is in the military, which is the correct thing to do. If you're going to have a sweetheart, if a young woman is going to have a sweetheart, he better be doing his bit. That's one of the social pressures that they're trying to bring into play, kind of through government propaganda. So uh, the young woman at the train station is sending her sailor off to war. And the young woman in front of the telegram, uh, it's hard to read, uh, but basically it says, um, we are informing you that Dan, that's all that we see is Dan. Um, and then you see wounded and then you see hospital. So her sweetheart was injured in some way from his ship and is now in a hospital. And she says uh, the tagline, that was the day I joined the waves. Now there are rules against this. If you are in the waves, you're, if you are married to a sailor, you're actually not allowed to join the waves. Uh, same with the, the Women's Army Corps. If you're married to a soldier, you're not allowed to join the army. You have to join a different branch. They actually end up lifting that later on uh, because it is restricting their applicant pool. But in both cases, the reason why these women in these posters are joining is because their man is involved in the war and they need to do something to assist him in his endeavors. So next up, this is the first recruiting poster for the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps in 1942, right after they're created that has nothing to do with men at all. <laughs> it says, attention women, join the WAC. There is nothing about a man. And we've had others, and there are some posters that I didn't include in this presentation that are about end the war sooner. Uh, there's a slogan, speed them back, join the WAC, um, all connected to the men. But this is the first one that I found that really says we're talking to women directly. Now, it doesn't tell us anything about why they should join the WAC. It's just, hey, women, you should be a part of the Army, and doesn't explain why, what the benefits are, what the deal is. Why do women need to go into this perceived hyper-masculine environment? Is there room for them there? Uh, so we have to start moving beyond this just let's do it. Uh, uh, you're probably familiar with the World War I poster of Uncle Sam leaning forward and pointing and says, I want you to join the army. Yeah, that's, that's what this is. It's the same thing. Now, 1943, we start seeing attempts to recognize that women are doing jobs that men are doing, and that's what we want women to understand. One of the interesting things uh, about the waves and about the Navy, is that the Navy really emphasizes its, its status as a man-making uh, outfit. Um, the other branches do have that conceit, uh, but the Navy is specifically, you join as a boy and you, you leave as a man, uh, and you become a man through naval service specifically. Uh, so that rhetoric is throughout their posters from 1940 uh, up until this when this one comes out. And that's what this is tapping into. And behind, we do see that there is a ship, and that is a destroyer. Um, and that means this ship is involved in a ship-to-ship -ship battle, and it's really calling up a lot of the very recent naval battles that have been happening in 1942 and 1943 in the Pacific. 
Uh, that's what they're referencing here. It would have been all over the news. And this is an image that women would have immediately understood as saying that even if they're not in combat, they are doing their part to help the U.S. win battles. Uh, it still kind of says that the job is man-sized, so it's for men. Uh, but we're, we're getting away from this idea that only men go to war. We're starting to see that women go to war as well, and that is a good and positive thing that they should be doing. Uh, it is also important to convince families and communities that soldiering is appropriate and patriotic work for women. What do I mean by that? I mean, you've got to convince the parents. Uh, the age limit for the Women's Army Corps, uh, you have to be at least 20 or 21, depending on when we're talking. Uh, same for the WAVES. The, most of these uh, auxiliary groups want women with some college in them, or at least to be a couple of years out of high school. Uh, they think that young women, much younger, are, are not ready to be away from family. And they emphasize that the military is going to be kind of standing in for parents as they take care of the young women who are joining the military. And both of these, uh, the, the father is for the waves and the mother is for the, the wax. They're both saying how proud they are of their daughter who serves. And that's important because Going all the way back to the revolution, there was an implication that women who worked with the military were prostitutes uh, and were there as uh, concubines for officers and things like that. And it was not something to be proud of. And here we're, we're pushing back on that pretty hard that women can go into the military and have it not be related to sex work of any kind, to be actually part of the military for military reasons. And you can be proud of them for that. That's an important thing, and this is a common theme. Even though both of these are created uh, in 1943, they are used throughout the war, and they are actually among the first uh, set of posters that come out in the summer of 1943 that are a result of the OWI looking at what they have and saying, you know, we need to actually talk to uh, the people who are most involved in women's decision to join the military. So that's the women themselves, their communities, and their employers. And like, those are the three. So we've got the women and now we're talking to their families. Uh, we also see that the OWI in particular recognizes that men join the military for a lot of reasons and women do as well, okay? And it's, again, it's in 1943 when this starts to come through the recruiting material. Uh, we have uh, the women in front of the city, don't miss your great opportunity. This is tying into, for the Navy, the Navy as the center of adventure. And again, growth and becoming an adult. One of the things that the Navy shifts from, it shifts from a man-making outfit to an adult-making outfit, which seems subtle. And it is subtle, but it's so significant because they really work very, very hard in the 1940s to get rid of gender distinctions. Um, when women were in the Navy in World War I, they were enlisted as yeomen, as the men were. And they actually ended up having to change that because they kept on accidentally assigning women to ships in World War I. So by the time we get to World War II, they are the waves and they get their ranks through the waves, but they're indicated as they're part of this other group to indicate that they're women. In World War I, they had to put an F in parentheses after yeomen so that when they were billeting ships, they knew not to put the girls on the boat. <laughs> The other poster is for the Cadet Nurse Corps, and this is how we talk to the teenagers, because teenage boys can go into the military. They can enlist in uh, all of the branches at 17 with parental permission or 18 without across the board, and uh, there is no equivalent for young ladies. They can work at the USO or in the canteen, or they can be a part of the Red Cross or they can do any number of local community-based events, but they can't actually enlist. However, by 1942, there is already a serious nurse shortage. Um, there are two military nursing corps that we'll see in a little bit. The Army and the Navy each have their own separate nursing corps. Army uh, Nurse Corps is from 1901. Navy Nurse Corps is instituted in uh, 1908. So they've been around a while and military nursing is an acceptable thing for women to do, but not everyone has the aptitude to be a nurse, which is why we have these other uh, 
uh, military corps for women to join to do other work besides nursing. But for girls who do want to be a nurse, to want to get the education, to get a career, maybe they can't uh, see a way to kind of get through nursing school or pay for it or anything like that. If they sign up for the cadet nurse corps in high school and commit to serving for a certain amount of time in one of the military nursing corps, their nursing school will be paid for and they can get a complete education in nursing. And then they go and they serve their time in the military and then they come back and they have access to a, a lot of career opportunities because they can also get specialized training in the military. For example, women who come through the cadet nurse corps can get their nursing school education for free, join the army nurse corps, and then take training in the army air forces, army air service as, as flight nurses to work on the airlift of uh, airlift planes that are shipping wounded from the, bat, the, the theater of battle to stateside hospitals or hospitals on bases. That's not training that you can't get that training anywhere else in the 1940s. And if you want to work in something like that, you have to go into the military to get that education. After World War II, there's a high demand for women who have that training. And uh, a lot of them turn into our first flight attendants. Whoops. All right. Now we start talking about pride in service, about doing it because it's the best way to do your part and it's something that you can be proud of it's not just sitting at home knitting socks or rolling bandages you're actually doing something and uh the waves recruiting poster uh with the billboard it's uh I'm, i don't know if you all can see that it says waves honor roll and it's a list of names and uh they don't actually have a lot of names on there but this is a picture that I took at the Library of Congress. Those are my feet in the picture. I was standing on a shelf taking a picture uh, down on it, but I got up really, really close. And a couple of those names are women who were decorated waves. They'd done things that were considered heroic, that were considered um, really powerful uh, things for women to do. Most waves are kept stateside, but we do have a lot of women like in code breaking offices who are catching things that other code breakers aren't. Um, so it's things like that are getting put up on this waves honor roll. And these are names that women would know. These are the ones that are published uh, when they're kind of sent out as propaganda for a look at what waves are doing. Those are the names that are showing up on this waves honor roll. So it's a very clear connection. The other one uh, is a play on the World War I cartoon. What did you do in the Great War, Papa? And it's to designed to get men to enlist in the British uh, Armed Forces during World War I. And here we have the proposal for the Women's Army Corps uh, for women. And they didn't go with it. But I just, I really found it interesting that they were considering this as an option. And I just wanted to share it. Then we have the realization that women are patriotic. Women love their country as much as men do, and they want to serve their country as much as men do. And now the one, I'm in this war too, that really does tap into a lot of what women are saying. I am part of this, I'm doing this too. Uh, the blue star flag is a flag hung up by families to indicate a, uh, a family member in the service, especially when we are actively deploying uh, people uh, to theaters of war. Uh, Gold Star is for a, a family member who has been killed uh, while in service. And then they would have a number of stars uh, for how many service, how many family members are in the service. So this young lady is pointing to her Blue Star flag saying, hey, this, this star is for me. I'm here too. I'm doing my part too. The other poster is going where we're needed most. And this is an interesting transition, and we're going to see why in a moment. Uh, but we're starting out with, we need these women to kind of fill in the gaps and do the work that we need them to do. But there is another angle that the WAC starts to pick up. The army is in the most places in the world. Uh, they are all over all the theaters of war. They are in uh, every part of uh, Europe, North Africa. Uh, they're in China uh, and they send WACs there. Uh, they send WACs up to Alaska, they send them Everywhere, just everywhere that there is an army, there is usually a WAC contingent somewhere because armies have headquarters and headquarters need 
uh, bureaucratic staff, and that's what the WAC is doing. Oh, we're not there yet. We'll get there. Uh, so the initial efforts for the WAC had two themes. So number one, here we have speed them back, join the WAC that I mentioned earlier. Um, the I don't know if you can see that clearly behind the woman with the whistle. It's uh, troop ranks of men in battle dress, and they're getting they're marching into combat. And so the the idea is is that if we can join the WAC, we can bring them back sooner. And then again, this is my war too. These are both 1942. We have created the WAC. We have to get women in here. Here are some ideas. Just throw stuff up and see how it works. Now, 1943, we take that it's my war too, and we say, well, women have a place in war as well. And there are eight of these posters, a whole series of women doing different jobs that are unexpected. And I pulled two technical ones. So the first one is laboratory assistant, chemical laboratory assistant. Um, they actively go to colleges to recruit women who are chemistry majors to have them join the WAC. And then uh, the other one is a cartographer for army ground forces, basically mapping out where they are and where they're going and the routes they're taking and tracking units. So it's easier to kind of figure out where everyone is. Um, there are other things. There are a weather observer. Um, there is a photography assistant. There is air traffic controller, radio man, radio man, radio woman, uh, all kinds of things that are surprising. Pharmacists uh, assistant, pharmacist in general, just the name pharmacist. A lot of these jobs are things that women can do. And they want to emphasize it by using pictures of women doing the work. And that's the great thing about late 43 into 44 is that they have pictures of women doing the work. An illustration is all well and good, but that's just imagination. This is an actual woman in the army doing this actual job right here. And we took a picture and we're showing it to you, okay? This taps into going where we're needed. This is wax are going places. This is a poster series of five posters. And uh, you see the one where um, the woman is meeting with a Native American uh, who is wearing a very long war bonnet and she's being fitted with a war bonnet herself. And then the lower two pictures, uh, they're looking at the Washington Monument, and that is in the southwest. That is, uh, the other one is a hacienda outside of Los Angeles, I think. Um, but these are places that they go in North America to all of the different installations around North America. The other one, uh, that top picture, they're in Italy. So these women are going to places where the fighting has just finished. Italy was a hard fought theater of war. Uh, they had nurses and a hospital in the same half mile, uh, half acre area uh, of the landing point at Anzio in the initial invasion. And those nurses came under repeated fire. They brought in a WAC contingent uh, once they broke out of Anzio. They brought in a WAC contingent almost immediately to handle administrative tasks. And one of the groups that they are searching for among women is women who are multilingual and they are looking for women who speak Italian to send to Italy to act as translators. That's who one of that one of these women in that top picture is a translator and she is communicating with that Italian man to try and figure something out. Uh, they don't say what. <laughs> but that's what's happening there. They also go to colleges and they specifically have these two posters, college women in the black. I don't know why they didn't continue it. I guess they felt that it wasn't effective enough, but you can see again, it's the use of the photographs. It's showing women doing the things and doing things that you wouldn't expect are necessary for warfare. And what's interesting about these three poster series uh, beyond everything else that I've talked about, is that it is actively showing the work of a modern army, whether a man or a woman is doing the job. Warfare is different, is what these posters are saying. The military is different. It's not what it used to be. And we have to innovate and we have to keep up if we are going to succeed. That's the underlying message of all of these posters. So now we're moving into the waves, the Navy. This is, uh, by the way, this woman is a parachute rigger. Uh, that's what she's doing. She's figuring out where all the lines are so it can pack up and deploy uh, safely and cleanly uh, so the person can get to the ground safely. Uh, 
WAMES materials are actually very similar to Navy materials for men. The WAVES, uh, because they were a few months behind the WAC in formation and in advertising, see the mistakes that the WAC is making, and they kind of are able to skip over that initial moment of growing pains. So again, we start out with patriotism. Uh, instead of we're going to end the war sooner, we have a defense of freedom. We're going to make men free. It's a line from Battle Hymn of the Republic from the Civil War. The other one, the billboard, emphasizes that she is a telegraph operator, that she is doing something that is considered a man's job. And it is a woman, it's a woman's war too. Again, that same slogan shows up throughout the recruiting material, no matter what the branch is. The waves are part of the Navy. And while the name is Volunteer Emergency Service, there is a recognition that there are women who are going to have a career in the Navy after the war is over. So the first one is, uh, you'll be happy to and feel so proud serving as a wave in the Navy. Okay, you'll be happy, but they're trying to say that this is a place where you can grow. And it doesn't come through clearly here, but what I like about this one, it's a picture of a group of waves on the graduation day from indoctrination. Uh, they have made it through, they are fully parts of the Navy, and they are about to go to their various duty stations, further schooling, wherever it is that they're going. This is um, that moment where they are actually part of the Navy for the first time. And putting those that that image and that statement together to me is a, a really powerful thing. And again, this is an image that women at the time would recognize. They have seen by the time we get to late 1943, which is when this poster comes out, they've seen images of graduations from indoctrination. They've seen women in uniform around in newsreels if they're close by to a, a military base. They're seeing them working. Uh, out and about in the regular everyday life. So they're aware and they're aware of this imagery, okay? Okay, the other one is very blatant on the same team. This is the only branch that says this, that you are 100% part of the Navy. That is so powerful and I'm always surprised, I'm still surprised that no one else recognized that saying you are fully a part of this group is such a powerful recruiting thing. Here is where it really comes home. In both of these posters, they're showing the rankings that women can earn and they're showing the pay scales. And they are emphasizing that women earn the same as men. If they have, if they have the same rating, it does not matter what their gender is. Everyone who is an ensign, everyone who is a yeoman, everyone who is a chief earns the same pay. They're the only group that does this right off the bat. The Women's Army Corps actually has to adjust their pay scale because they are losing women to the waves because of this, because the waves pay the same amount as they do the men. And that that is a big, big deal. I mean, we still have gendered pay gaps today. So to have people come out in the 40s and say, hey, we're paying you exactly what we pay the men, that is a big deal. And a lot of women who recognize that one of the reasons why they're choosing the military is for the steady paycheck. They're going to go for the waves. The Marines. The Marines are the last group to be created. They are created in uh, February, oh, February 13th, 1943 is their official birthday, although they are enlisting women uh, in late January and early uh, February. Um, but they start recruiting uh, pretty intensely uh, right away, uh, February, March, uh, into April of 1943. What's interesting is they don't have a lot of variety in their recruiting material. They are leaning on being Marines, and their whole slogan is, be a Marine, free a Marine to fight. Which is interesting in and of itself, because you're going to be a Marine, fantastic, and you're freeing a Marine to fight. But if you're a Marine, why aren't you going to fight? And so it's this conflict between, yes, the women are all Marines, but the women don't fight, only men Marines fight. And that is something that they grapple with until the 50s. Uh, and then they start changing up like how they are structuring 
uh, their recruiting and how they're structuring their women's uh, Marine Reserve. It's the Women's Reserve of the Marine Corps, and they are considered basically permanent reservists, like men Marines can be on reserve, but they're not active duty, technically. And they change up the structure in the 50s and 60s to kind of deal with this conflict of, are we Marines or are we not Marines? Um, the uh, By the way, the woman on the billboard is uh, the uh, director. <laughs> She's the director at this point, Ruth Cheney uh, Street, or Ruth Streeter Cheney. Sorry. Uh, she is uh, brought in because she looks like she is, uh, she looks like she looks motherly, is what they say. She's got uh, two grown sons who are in the military, and she um, wants to present this idea that she's going to keep the girls safe. And that's really important. Um, and that really does work well in the first few months of recruiting. By the time we get to late 43, there's this real understanding of what it means to be a Marine and the Marine cachet for the men has kind of rubbed off on the women. And we see a lot of women make initially go to the Marine Corps to say, hey, I would like to be a Marine because y'all are the best. Um, that doesn't always work. Um, and But the Marine Corps... Uh, consistently, the women Marines consistently exceed their recruiting goals. Uh, starting in uh, June '43, all the way through to uh, December '44 or December '44. Yes, when they start doing the drawdown in December of '44, they stop. They they kind of lower their recruitment goals and they start slowing down recruiting um, because they see that the war is about to end. So one of the first things that the military does is it stops bringing in women in late '44. This is the one you probably haven't heard of. <laughs> this is the Coast Guard, Coast Guard SPARS, which stands for Semper Paratus, Always Ready, which is the Coast Guard uh, motto. Uh, they start uh, around the same time as uh, the Marine Corps. They, I think they beat the Marine Corps by like a month, but they are... Uh, at this point, they're under the Navy branch. They've been, Coast Guard has been moved to the Navy for the duration of the war from the Treasury. And we're starting to see them ramp up uh, their recruiting. The SPARs have a unique problem or a unique role to play rather in that the Coast Guard is in some degree Coast Watchers. They are Home Guard. They are stationed all along the coastlines and they are manning lighthouses. They are patrolling the waters, things like that. There are listening stations and that's where they need women. And we see in the one with the woman in white, uh, she's standing in front of a lighthouse and that's actually a job that they would give to women. They would train women to be lighthouse keepers and just drop them off <laughs> and let them uh, be in the lighthouse as they would drop off men to be in the lighthouse. And then they would pull the men and put them on cutters and have them out at sea. Um, Coast Guard spars also worked again, administrative tasks and things like that. But what they're doing is they're looking at the traditional work of women in, in, in when it comes to fighting and putting women in those roles. The other poster, I hope you can see that behind the woman saluting, there is a covered wagon and a woman in a dress and apron holding a rifle. Okay? And that really taps into the home defense aspect of the Coast Guard. Okay? Uh, this is a pioneer woman who is, it is implied, protecting her family from an attack. That's what the spars are trying to do. So they're really calling on this uh, mythology that we have of the pioneer spirit and home guard and things like that. And they're applying it to World War II. Okay, we're back to the nurse corps, <laughs> nursing corps. Uh, the Navy and the Army both start out in 19... 41 saying, oh, we're going to run out of women. Uh, the Army and Navy Nurse Corps actually start actively recruiting in late 1940 uh, because people can see war is coming. Uh, and so they, they also recognize that it's going to be a pretty bloody war and they are going to need more people in hospitals. When Pearl Harbor happens, uh, the Pearl Harbor uh, facility is staffed by both Army and Navy nurses. On the same day as the Pearl Harbor attacks, there are attacks in Dutch Harbor, Alaska, and Manila Bay in the Philippines. And in both cases, those facilities have hospitals that are staffed with nurses. And those nurses come under fire for the first time, along with men, 
this is a thing that I keep harping on because people want to tell me that women were never in combat zones and women have been in combat zones since we've had women in war. And specifically, field hospitals are set up within combat zones. So nurses who go into the military learn very quickly that there's a darn good chance that they are going to be under fire. They're going to be getting shelled. Um, over the course of World War II, 19 nurses are killed by enemy fire uh, coming under attack. Usually it's a shelling of a hospital um, or a, a bombing run uh, into a, a headquarters area where that's a target. Um, there are other uh, women who die uh, while in service. Uh, most are through uh, misadventure, car accidents, things like that, or illness. But there are 19 who die of combat-related injuries. These initial posters are tapping into ideas of the nobility of nursing. Uh, you can see the Army nurse, of course, she's wearing a cape. That is a callback to the 19th century uniforms for nurses. Uh, we're going to see that nurses don't actually wear that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they're in they're in combat zones and they're wearing trousers and they're wearing shirts and their their hair is up under a, an army cap and they do not look this pretty but it makes for good recruiting. But the men come back in recruiting material for nurses and I find that fascinating. Both of these are from forty four and these two men uh, are both uh, wounded uh, in these two are both from Europe, uh, one from Italy and one from Normandy. Um, there are 10 posters in this series, and the men are all wounded in different areas. There are a couple from the Pacific, but most are from Europe and Italy, or Normandy and Italy. And it's this idea that a woman or a nurse is, is a special kind of a special kind of person. Uh, there's this idea of the, the military nurse as the angel of the battlefield who comes in and rescues uh, wounded men. Um, this idea that these uh, military nurses are doing something uh, profound with their nursing degree. Nursing is already women's work and is considered uh, morally good, upstanding work. Add in the layer of military nursing during a war and it is patriotic and it is kind of the highest calling for a nurse. And that's really what they're trying to do because they're getting back into here's how you help the men and the army nurse corps uh, the navy nurse corps has a couple of these as well i just realized i pulled both examples from the army but uh in both cases they're saying that this is how you directly help the men we all talk about supporting the men supporting the boys doing it for the boys here is where you can actually do it for an individual someone whose name you will know and someone that you can talk to. And it's that intimate connection, that very close work with the men who are doing the fighting that the nurse corps are selling. Also, army nursing is exciting. Uh, <laughs> these are also in 1944. There are six of these posters. And uh, the one uh, where the women are looking at paintings, they're in China. I don't know if you can see clearly, uh, but there's Chinese lettering. Uh, on those uh, uh, panels that they're looking at. And then of course, it's uh, images of the women uh, working throughout. But the other one shows the women loading wounded onto a plane. And this is the flight nursing that I was talking about. And flight nursing is brand new in World War II. Um, they started helicopter evacuations of wounded in World War II and they started um, uh, the flight nursing and uh, airplane-based evacuation, med medical evacuation, all of these started in World War II and they really set it up and that they have a forward field hospital uh, in, the, in the combat zone. So there is the front line and then you have kind of the, the, the staging area. And then behind that front line is the aid station where it's, there aren't usually women there, but that's where the medics are. And they like bandage you up and decide, are you just, are you going to go back out or are you going to go to the hospital? And then they go, to, then the next level back, it's an ambulance ride to the hospital. And then if you need more treatment than the field hospital can give you. And when we're talking about field hospital, by the way, think of NASH, the TV show. Uh, that's the field hospital that we're talking about. If they decide that you need more care, like they can't patch you up and send you back. 
they need to send you to a more stable location, they will load you onto a plane like we see in this poster. And that is when we leave the combat zone. So there are nurses in that field hospital and on those planes. Uh, and they are part of the process of getting the more severely wounded men out of uh, the combat zone. It's exciting. It is brand new. It is, I mean, absolutely cutting edge technology, cutting edge technique. Uh, it is saving lives because men are getting better treatment much, much faster. So it's a really uh, powerful thing to say that you are doing this thing that's brand new and is saving lives. But they can't all be winners. Uh, <laughs> This is a Coast Guard Spars poster from 1944. After all of that work, we come back to a uh, woman as accessory on the arm of Uncle Sam. Um, and that's how you're going to serve your country, uh, by making a date with Uncle Sam. So we've seen a real change in how we address women and how we think about women in the military and how they are part of a tradition of making citizens, making adults, it's no longer making men. And it is acknowledging women's patriotism and love of country and the fact that women are actually people like men are. And it seems silly to say it that way, but that's really the realization that happens. It's, it's almost as if a light bulb goes off and they say, but women are people. That's kind of weird, isn't it? Well, let's, let's go with that, that women are people. Uh, there are some uh, great conversations that are happening about telling men that if your woman, if your wife, if your daughter goes to work, joins the military, and you're concerned about the state of your household, you're going to have to step up and pick up the slack. And that's the first time that we see that as well. So it's this real moment of women are people, women are fully citizens, and women are fully capable of doing everything that we are asking men to do. Maybe we should just be asking citizens to do this. And this is the point where we actually see that happening in military recruiting. So that's my presentation. <clears throat> Sorry, thank you for that. It was very informative. And as I said in the beginning, if you have any questions to type them in the chat and I will read them over and, and for her to answer. So, okay, so I have a question from Terry. Was, what was it like for the women after the war, she says? So um, I'm going to stop sharing real quick. All right. So after the war, uh, it depends. <laughs> so we have the women who uh, were um, going to be out as soon as the war was over. Women enlisted for the duration um, or, or four years, basically. That was how they worked it out. Is you'll, you can enlist for two years, four years, or for the duration. And most women actually enrolled for the duration. Um, women uh, who wanted to be done could be done. Uh, a lot of women are given the option, for example, when uh, the Women's Army Corps becomes the Women's, or the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps becomes the Women's Army Corps, uh, about 25% of the women actually choose not to be uh, re-enlist in the Women's Army Corps. Um, but after the war, a lot of women uh, go home and they find their sweethearts um, and they try to settle down and have uh, a normal life as much as they can. Uh, the problems that they run into are a result of uh, kind of an incomplete uh, revolution, if you will. Um, a lot of people don't recognize that women went to war. And so we see a lot of these women attempting to access GI Bill benefits, attempting to access VA benefits, um, and being asked, uh, where is your husband? And people not recognizing that they are the veteran. Uh, Although I will say, one of my favorite stories uh, comes from a former army nurse who had been at Anzio and had been shelled repeatedly while working at that um, 
at that field hospital. And it's in the late fifties. She's, you know, a married suburban mom and uh, there's a problem with the septic tank out back. So the plumber is out there with her and they're, they're looking at things and a car backfires on the street and they both hit the ground. And he looks up at her and says, so where were you? And she says, Anzio. And he says, yeah, me too. And then they get up and they carry on. (laughs) Um, And it's, they would find each other in places, but one of the, the most successful things for, for kind of getting themselves support was that they would form voluntary associations or clubs where they would get together, reunion associations. Um, for example, the 68th, 88th, which was a postal battalion, uh, was an African-American women's battalion. Uh, and they were actually sent to uh, France to deal with the backlog of uh, mail that had happened. And they cleared... Uh, months worth of uh, backlog of mail in about half the time that they had been allotted. Uh, They are the only African-American women's battalion to be sent overseas, and uh, they won many awards for it. And they have created their own reunion group, and they continued to meet. Uh, They're not meeting anymore, but they were still meeting in the early 2000s. They were still getting together and hanging out and catching up and everything. Um, there so are. Has, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, there's another question. Okay. That um, kind of re- relates to the, the, what you were talking about. So Rebecca, <laughs> ha- her question: Were there segregated units for African American women of, or women of color? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, there were. Uh, the army is segregated until 1948, uh, and all of the recruiting is aimed at white women. Um, there is actually a letter uh, from one of from the head of Women Power at uh, the Office of War Information, Women Power Campaigns, uh, Mary Brewster White, where she says uh, there is no plan to recruit African-American women at this time. It's actually a real problem because we have this, because we've got this uh, separate structure. If we're going to support African-American men, you know, are we supporting them with white women? And it becomes a problem when we have segregated hospitals, but only white nurses and white men get angry at white nurses caring for black soldiers. And they actually have to like hide that they're doing it. And they actually are forced to create African-American nursing units um, in the Army and Navy Nursing Corps, which they didn't have before in 1940. There is a letter from the head of the Navy Nurse Corps to an applicant that says there is no no space for, we're not going to be recruiting African-American women. We don't have African-American units. So uh, there aren't enough African-American men uh, in the the Navy to support having a separate unit to support them. And she's got to walk that back. Uh, It's the same thing with the the Marine Corps. There aren't enough African-American men being replaced that need to be replaced in the uh, Marine Corps that we need to bring in African-American women to do their jobs. And it's it drives bean counters crazy, by the way. There are so many memos (laughs) from the uh, the accounting offices going, why are we building? basically four sets of everything. We've got the one for the white men, the one for the black men, the one for the white women, and now we've got one for the black women, and this is inefficient. And why are we doing it? We are wasting so much money. And those start in 1942, uh, when we first have the WAC, and we start building out barracks for the WAC, and there's a bean counter going, ha, ah, that's expensive. Why are we doing that? This is dumb. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there are a lot of African-American women's units, uh, but they are mostly kept stateside. And they are... Uh, doing things like domestic labor, they are char women, they are cooks and bakers and things like that, uh, mostly doing uh, extensions of what black women are expected to do in civilian life. Uh, there is an attempt to recruit Chinese women into uh, the military, and they aren't necessarily segregated, neither are uh, Native American women or women uh, of other ethnicities. Um, but there is a specific a- a- attempt to recruit Chinese American women Uh, No word on how successful that was. Um, They don't really kind of pin down how many they're trying to get. They just like to encourage them. Uh, Filipino women, Filipinas are actually recruited specifically to the Army Nurse Corps and the Navy Nurse Corps. And we have a long history of Filipinas as nurses in the country in general. Um, Japanese Americans are not part of this because because of racism, we have interned them in concentration camps uh, throughout the American West. And 
while uh, the 442nd is an infantry unit made up of Japanese American men who have been interned and they're filled from homegrown concentration camps and sent to fight in Italy, um, there is no corresponding Japanese American women's unit or even a path for Japanese American women to get into the military. Okay, so our next question is from Maria. Such a great presentation. Can you share a little bit about your grandmother's personal experience? <laughs> so, uh, Grandma uh, was a was a farmer's daughter who had to move to the big city because she didn't want to be a farmer, um, and she got a job um, working. Oh, she was clerking somewhere, and then uh, she met my grandfather in like 1938, 39. And uh, they were going to get married. Uh, and in order to support the family, he joined the military in 1940. He volunteered. Um, and then the war started picking up. And basically, um, she said, I'm, I'm just going to get a job um, because I know it's coming. And she decided that she was going to find an industrial job. And they were in Dayton, Ohio. And the biggest in, in, industrial uh, job there was that Frigidaire factory. And they were transferring over to mess kits. And she was um, operating a press and she was just stamping out the uh, the outside of the mess kit. <laughs> um, and that was all she did, uh, you know, for her eight hours a day. I think it was eight hours a day, four days, uh, five days a week. Um, and she just waited for my granddad to come home. And he was all over um, doing a lot of things with the Army Air Service and finally ended up in uh, India, China, Burma, India, and came home in 44, 44, and because um, his hitch was four years, and he uh, got a job as a postal carrier, and um, grandma decided that she didn't want to do the industrial work, but she, the war was still on, and she got that nurse's training uh, as a nurse's aide, and it's not full nursing school, but it's, uh, we'd call it a CNA today, a certified nursing assistant, that was basically what she was. Um, and she did it because she wanted to earn her own money. She wanted to have uh, not rely on uh, a husband's goodwill. Uh, and she mentioned that she would get frustrated because he really wanted to have a farm and he really wanted to move to the country. And she was like, no. She used to say, I, I can't believe I went to the city and found a guy with dirt between his toes <laughs> that he wanted to go live in the country. Um, and she uh, forced him, basically, like, if we're going to live in the country, we're going to live close enough that I can still have a job that isn't being a farm wife, because I did not sign up for that. And so they have a little, they had a little small family farm where they raised chickens. Uh, and grandma worked, and granddad was a postal uh, worker. And like, that was the closest that he could get. And uh, grandma still kept her job. And she was a nursing aide until in her 60s, when she retired. Um, yeah, so that was, she used her World War II era training to have a career that she really enjoyed and really let her maintain her independence. And from my reading, that is a really common experience. Um, so I have a question. Um, I know like they're kind of not military quote unquote, but like the Red Cross, what did like recruitment look like for women for during World War II for them? Oh, I have, I have so many <laughs> I have so many Red Cross posters on the hard drive at home. Um, yeah, recruiting for the Red Cross is interesting because they are an independent organization, but they are developed from basically the Crimean War of the 1850s and then the Civil War uh, with Clara Barton uh, making the American Red Cross. Uh, they are closely tied with military nursing. And so what we see in 1942, uh, there's an arrangement that the OWI and the two nursing corps make with the Red Cross and that the Red Cross is going to recruit nurses, just nurses. Are you interested in going to nursing school? Do you have any nursing experience? Do you want to get training? This is how my grandma got her training. Uh, <laughs> all of this. And then the Red Cross would say, okay, so you, person A, you're talking about wanting to actively work with the union, wounded, and you're talking about the Pacific Theater, we're going to put you in the Navy Nurse Corps. And then you, person B, are talking about helping people at places like Walter Reed, we're going to put you in the Army Nurse Corps and send you to a stateside hospital, and so on and so on. Uh, it was a place where uh, girls could get uh, basic uh, first aid training and see if they wanted to get into nursing. Um, 
there are a lot of uh, young women who sign up with the Red Cross ostensibly for nursing training. They start out in that and then they find that that's not something that they're suited to. And they are able to work with the Red Cross to find other war work. Um, a lot of these girls end up transferring over to the USO and working at those canteens and the, and the dances uh, at the recreation for the soldiers. So that is, if anybody has any more questions, but that was, well, my question was the last question. So thank you for coming to speak with us. Um, if you like what you heard, interested, we're having a companion exhibit at our SCCHA opening March 21st, and, and it's going to be open till April 30th, and there's more information on our Facebook page. So thank you again for joining us and that wonderful talk. It's great to learn more about women in World War II.